Thank you, Mr. Goyal. Uh, very powerful three points which I really saw or came through was one was that it, the government has to be pro-business uh, to really be pro-poor. That's an exceptional sto story or that's an exceptional idea because that's the truth or the paradigm thing. The second thing which I really believe was absolutely great, the idea of change in bureaucracy because I believe that is one of the la last relics of the Raj which needs to be changed and changed very, very strongly. Because if we don't do that, we'll actually get uh, stifled because of the bureaucratic hurdles or regulatory cliffs that can actually get created. Uh, so having said that, uh, I think now is the time that we, we have all been waiting for. Uh, in fact, uh, we have Professor Michael Porter with us. In fact, I've had the privilege of knowing him for the last 12, 13 years. Uh, and I have had the privilege of working with him on many issues over a period of time, working in the area of competitiveness, in the area of social progress, shared value, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I've also had the privilege of teaching his course on competitiveness. And uh, I, he, I always call him as my friend, philosopher, guide. Uh, and of course, uh, this man needs no other introduction rather than saying that he is the father of the modern strategy field. And without further ado, may I welcome the man uh, himself who is coming to India after 14 years. Professor, Mike, can we have you upstage, please? Thank you, Amit, for that wonderful introduction. Um, is everything working here? This is yellow. There we go. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, it was just a pleasure for me, even, even though we've just started today, to sit and, and listen to uh, Dr. De Bruy, uh it, it, what a you know, clear and lucid uh, introduction to this day. In fact, uh, I'm a little bit nervous now because he knows so much more about India than I do. And uh, the minister, uh, Goyal, also, uh, I think a very good, clear, uh, ri rigorous start to our discussion today. Um, and as, as uh, Amit said, um, I have been uh, on a personal journey uh, for the last 20 years, uh, trying to understand the fundamental causes of prosperity uh, and the enabling um, ideas and uh, uh, approaches and thinking that would actually allow prosperity to be increased and sustained and broadened across uh, a wide range of citizens in, in country after country. Uh, my work started very much in the economic sphere, that's how I'm trained, uh, but over time I have come to understand that uh, we have to look beyond narrow economic uh, factors if we're going to understand uh, what leads to prosperity, and I'll talk about that in, in a moment. Um, uh, it's been very, very long time since I have been here in India. I remember many years ago I did a project with CII to kind of take a look at what was going on in this country. That was in the early years after I published my book called Competitive Advantage of Nations, which started to lay out this framework. Um, and what we found then was just a lot of challenges. Uh, and uh, I, I have very strong memories of the big discussion about electricity and there was not enough, not enough, enough electricity. And, and, and we were in a very different place. But uh, I have been extremely excited to uh, come back to India today because uh, uh, it's really quite remarkable what is beginning to happen. Um, what we know about building prosperity is it's a marathon. You know, it's not a short race. It's a marathon. It takes decades to really transform a country's uh, potential and prosperity and to spread that prosperity broadly across citizens. Uh, no one government can do it. It's impossible. What you can do in four or five years or 10 years even is just move the needle. You can't solve this issue. Um, what we find is that the countries that uh, do best 
and that have made the most rapid progress have a very uh, a, a powerful way of sustaining progress. It's not just each government doing its own thing and then the next government throwing out what the previous government has done and doing something totally different. That doesn't work well. There has to be a shared understanding of what really creates prosperity. There has to be a shared understanding among stakeholders uh, that they can collaborate in uh, creating those circumstances. Uh, there needs to be uh, an ability to, be, uh, to, to uh, continue to pursue uh, priorities and a strategy that, that, that stretches over long periods of time. Uh, so we've learned a lot about competitiveness over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with many, many countries around the world on this topic, including my own. Uh, by the way, in America today, we are struggling. Uh, we, are, we are facing some real competitiveness challenges. Uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, for a whole variety of reasons, we can talk about those later if anybody's interested. But um, I think uh, what's fascinating to me and what's so important is what is beginning to happen in India. Because India has a special place in the world. It has a special place for a lot of reasons, you know. It's big. Uh, it, it's more than a billion people. Uh, it's a demo you're a democracy. A very big, very complicated democracy. Uh, that's special. Uh, this is a country, uh, I think, that is, has a legacy that is very complicated. A legacy of colonialism, a legacy of, of uh, bureaucracy, a legacy of socialism, a legacy of interventionism, a, a legacy that's challenging for building competitiveness. Uh, this is a country that has crushing challenges of lifting billions and billions, uh, not billions and billions, but at least a billion people or almost a billion people out of very, very uh, poor circumstances. Uh, India is a country that uh, we need to succeed. The, the, if India can succeed, the influence and impact that will have on the rest of the world will be uh, unbelievable. So I am here uh, because I am uh, fascinated by what's starting to happen. Uh, I'm here because uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a whole lot of experiments and learning going on in this country about prosperity and about development and about competitiveness. Okay, here we go. All right, so uh, again, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry uh, we had that interruption because I, I think that I just want to let you know, uh, I believe personally, I feel this very personally, I think it's so fundamentally important that this country succeed. And as I say, something very interesting is happening. I think there's an opportunity uh, that may be unprecedented to make progress right now. Uh, but if we're going to do that here in India, uh, we're going to have to think strategically about it. We're going to have to think beyond a single government, no matter how effective a given government is, it, it, it takes decades. We're going to have to, most of all, have a shared understanding of what success looks like. What I find around the world is really one of the biggest problems of increasing competitiveness and prosperity is that lots, everybody has their own idea of what that looks like. Uh, that we have many different groups, each of which has a different ideology and perspective. And we can't create a common understanding, a common reality, a common kind of pragmatic understanding of what it takes to win. So what I'd like to do this morning is, is not lay out a strategy for India. I wish I could. but. I've just come back after 14 years, uh, and I, I'm learning. And frankly, I learned a, a lot just 
sitting there and listening to these distinguished leaders talk this morning. What I'd like to talk about mostly in this brief session we have is, what have we learned about competitiveness? What have we learned about the fundamental causes of economic prosperity and the set of steps and choices necessary to move us in that direction? What have we learned? What do we know? We've had a very a revolution in how we think about competitiveness uh, around the world. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of false steps and, and false directions and a lot of bad ideas, but now I think we're starting to see a path. Uh, and again, I've been privileged to be at least a small part of that path in a variety of, of countries. Uh, and uh, the question is, what is that path? How do we think about this topic of competitiveness? How do we get away from simplistic ideas? How do we get away from uh, kind of uh, uh, little pieces that don't really capture the whole? How do we deal with the complexity of, uh, of any country? And India, of course, is in a way the most complex of all. That's what I'd like to talk about today. I, I will talk a little bit about India, but I do it with great, um, uh, let's, let's say, uh, sort of humility. I, I don't know this country as well as you do. Uh, but, but I do know a lot of other countries, and I do know a lot about uh, what the process of building prosperity looks like. Uh, so the hope is that as I, I talk about uh, India, I will uh, 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 open up some interesting ideas, but frankly, I'm, I'm very anxious to have our discussion later on. Uh, I, I, I'm very anxious to hear from you uh, because I think uh, it's actually going to be uh, as we together understand the circumstances of this country in the context of a powerful way of thinking about uh, competitiveness, that is going to be uh, the way uh, to succeed. Uh, that's going to be the path forward. So, uh, you know, where do we start when we, when we start thinking about uh, competitiveness and prosperity? Well, I think well, the shocking thing about this topic can be seen on this chart. This is like a dartboard. Uh, uh, look at the tremendous differences in prosperity among countries. Gigantic differences. We're in a global economy. You can go anywhere, anytime. You can trade around the world. We're in a global economy. Look at those differences in prosperity. Look at how some countries are actually declining in prosperity, whereas other countries are, are growing in prosperity. This is one of the great fundamental challenges of humanity, of why we have so many countries doing so poorly unable to make progress. Uh, but we also see some opportunities uh, for progress. We see some countries that have made great headway, others that are stuck. And the, the great puzzle of humanity today is what's causing this? How do we, how do we get ourselves on a path that allows us to improve our standard of living? to spread prosperity across citizens widely, not just for a few. Uh, this, this issue of how to drive uh, improvements and sustain uh, improvement in prosperity is, I think, the question of this age, of the, the issue in this global economy that we now live in, uh, although it's a little bit under siege right now. Uh, India, of course, on this chart is in a good place. Now, we'd like to see much higher income in this country. So one of the questions we have is how to, how to get off this chart onto the chart with the very wealthy countries. But the good news is there's something going on in India that's very positive. There's a growth here is meaningful and significant. We've seen some progress. The question then is, how do we understand how to take this further? Now, 
what we've learned is that if you want to progress your standard of living, if you want to become more prosperous, if you want to spread that prosperity more broadly across citizens, you've got to increase your competitiveness. We hear the word competitiveness a lot. Uh, 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 frankly, what we find is there's a lot of different definitions of competitiveness. There's a lot of different ways of thinking about it. One of the problems we have in countries is to get aligned. What do we mean by competitiveness? Competitiveness happens when we can do two things at the same time. First, we've got to create an environment in the country where firms operating in India, big firms, small firms, local firms, and foreign firms, where firms operating in India can compete successfully in domestic and international markets. For a country to be prosperous, business has to be successful. If firms can't compete, then nothing good can happen. Uh, so that's, that's part of competitiveness. But we know that it's not just firms that have to be progressing. A competitive economy is one where both firms can compete, but the average citizen is also improving their standard of living. We have to do these two things together. We can't have business doing well and the citizens doing poorly. That happens in a lot of countries. That's not going to work. That's not competitiveness. We can't have citizens with a lot of uh, benefits and so forth, but business not able to compete. We've got to put these two things together. We have to have business in an environment where it can be competitive, where it can compete, both, again, locally and internationally, but we also citizens do well. This is the, 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 the magic of successful competitiveness, is where we can put these things together. So many countries get stuck in one side doing well or the other. You know, uh, in, in Venezuela, the citizens have been given massive subsidies and all kinds of support and free uh, gasoline and all this stuff, but business in Venezuela can't compete. Venezuela is being destroyed before our very eyes. Other countries uh, we see, uh, and more typically, we see business doing pretty well, but the average citizen is not really benefiting from that. We have to put these things together. We have to see that business and society have to both win. We have to create an environment where citizens win and business wins. Uh, that's what uh, competitiveness looks like. We can't have one group ex succeeding at the expense of another. Now, in order to create this unique ability for both citizens and business to win, we have to be productive. If, you, if everything I say today, you forget. Just remember one thing. You have to earn your prosperity. You have to earn it. And you earn it by being productive. Produ productivity is the ability to create a lot of output, valuable output, per day of work. If you can create a lot of value in a day of work, because you're skilled, because you have an efficient business environment, then you can get paid a lot. But if you can't be productive, if, if, if you you have a lot of inefficiency and things are slow and there's no skills and, and, and you can't really produce uh, much productive work, then you're going to have a low wage. The, the, the wages uh, are a relationship, uh, are, are tied to the productivity. The number one central challenge of any economy that wants to be competitive is to build productivity for everybody. And that, that, has, that has many dimensions, which we'll talk about in, in a minute. We have to have existing firms and workers 
more and more productive over time, the more and more productive they get, the higher the average income is going to be. This is kind of the iron rule of the global economy. If you want to be wealthy, you have to be productive. Uh, but we also need high participation. We need as many people in our society that want to work to be able to join the productive workforce. That's called workforce participation. Uh, it's not just having the people working being productive. We also have to create an environment where people that want to work can enter that productive workforce. And uh, because if, most of, if a lot of people aren't in the workforce, it's very hard for your average annual income to get very high. Okay? And India, of course, has a big issue with workforce participation. We have a lot of citizens that aren't really participating in a very significant way in the economy, and that is really holding down our income as a society. And obviously, it's, if for those people that can't participate, uh, this system is not working for them. So we have to think about competitiveness in a way that's not just focused on the existing businesses and the existing people working uh, in jobs. We have to create an uh, uh, economic plan that focuses on getting as many people that really want to participate and want to work into the productive workforce. And that's, that's a more complicated challenge in many cases because there are reasons why people aren't in the productive workforce. And we've got a lot of people like that in India uh, that we have to deal with. Competitiveness is being productive. <laughs> if you're productive, you can have a good income. Uh, competitiveness is not low wages. You hear this a lot. You hear people say, well, our wages are high, so therefore we're not competitive. Well, that's crazy. The goal of competitiveness is high wages. <laughs> we want wages to go up. That's the goal. That's the point. Uh, we also have a lot of people talking about currencies and say, well, the dollar is going up, so therefore we're no, not as competitive because the dollar is high. Well, that's not competitiveness. The value of the currency, we, we want the value of our currency to be high. If a rupee is, is, is worth a lot, that means that all of you can buy whatever you need from abroad at a lower price. If your currency goes down, that means that everything you want to buy from abroad, which you need things from abroad in a modern global economy, you need machinery, you need all kinds of stuff. If your currency goes down, that means you have to pay more for everything you buy from abroad. We want to support a strong currency. We want the, the countries that are getting wealthier, their currency gets stronger, not weaker. And they can support that strong currency because they're productive. And they're, they're producing ex, uh, goods and services that are high quality, and they're producing them efficiently so they can support that strong currency. Believe it or not, this one slide is the most important slide in competitiveness. Because so many people around the world don't understand this. They think somehow competitiveness is due to... Um, you know, some particular government policy, or they think that there's all kinds of misunderstandings. There's ideology. Uh, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's blaming other people for your problem. Oh, it's the rest of the world that's causing us to be poor. No, it's not the rest of the world. It's us. It's the kind of environment we create for business and for citizens to be able to be productive in engaging in, the, in economic activity. That's what competitiveness is all about. And we have to deal with the fundamental drivers here. We have to figure out how to create an economy that, that raises its productivity over time. And we have to fundamentally create a successful environment for business. One of the things I think I'm, uh, everybody has to understand here, 
is you can't have business not succeed and have the society succeed. Again, I find there's a lot of nervousness about business. Some people are anti-business. They think business is doing the wrong thing or they think business is not being uh, ethical. There's a lot of anxiety about business. And there should be because businesses have done a lot of bad things around the world. But make no mistake, India is not going to be successful unless we create an environment where business in India is successful. Because business is our only institution in society that can actually create wealth. For-profit business is how wealth is created. When, when a company is able to meet a need, create a product, meet a need, and do it efficiently and productively, and make a profit, that's how wealth is created. Government is really important, but it can't create wealth. It, it can take, it can, it, can, it can levy taxes and use the tax money to do important work. You know, NGOs can't create wealth. NGOs are really important. They, they, they allow us to deal with a lot of societal needs. We have a lot of NGOs in, in this country to help deal with all the societal problems that you have. But NGOs can't create wealth either. They, they have to depend on donations and support from people that care. And thank God, many here do support those organizations. But they can't create wealth. Only business can create wealth. We can't be anti-business and pro-prosperity. Indians have to understand this. There's a legacy of business in this country that has many people very concerned and even angry. We have to get over that. We have to create an environment where business can thrive, and we have to have citizens that understand that that's, that's part of building the prosperity of the country. We've got to make that work. We have to deal with the abuses. We had really a bad, some bad business government relationship in the past. We've got we to change that relationship. We've got to harness business to be a force to actually uh, enhance and spread prosperity to everybody. And business can do that, but we have to think differently about business than has often been the case here in this country. If, if we can just understand this one slide and actually live this, if we can put aside all the old ideas and all the old ang anger and frustration and ideology and history, if we can put aside that and just be practical and say, look, it's all about creating a productive society, a productive economy in which anybody that wants to can participate. That's what it's all about. And uh, and we've got, to, we've got to figure out how to get there. That's what competitiveness is all about. And uh, I have seen miracles happen when societies and leaders can get aligned on this way of thinking. And where everything is about how can we be more productive. <laughs> where every citizen is thinking about how can I equip myself to be more skilled so I can be more productive. Where every business is thinking, I don't, well, I don't, uh, not about getting a special favor from government or a certain subsidy, where business is thinking about what, what do I need to do to raise the bar and, and be more productive. That's what we have to create in this country. And it's happening. It's happening. It's not happening enough. It's not happening in a broad enough base. So what do we know? We also know that when we try to build a productive economy and drive prosperity, we can't just think narrowly about economic development. Um, you know, there, I, I used to think that we could. But what I've learned over these years of working in this field is that actually there's a fundamental connection between economic development and social development. We can't have a healthy economy with a sick and broken society. It just doesn't work. 
Not as a matter of justice. Yes, that's an injustice. But it's not just that. It's just a practical reality. We can't have economic success and productivity that causes it if a lot of people uh, are uh, sick or uneducated or don't have a decent place to live. We have to see economic development and social development as not different things, but the same thing. Synergistic. We have to do both together. We have to think strategically about how to move both of these issues. If we focus just on social development and forget the economic development, then we're going to quickly run out of money. But if we focus only on economic development and forget about uh, social uh, progress, uh, then we're going to run out of capacity uh, and we're actually not going to be successful in moving the economy. So we've started to see these things together. And we'll talk this afternoon about uh, the social progress uh, work that we've now done and the measurement of this and how to think about it and how to drive social progress. We'll talk about that this afternoon. So given this background, I think India has made significant economic progress. I think everybody sitting in this room should be optimistic. Now I know there's a lot of debate in India about everything. You know, you guys are really good at that. You have a you're productive and having a lot of debate. Uh, and there's a lot of you know, people worried about this thing in the government or this policy or that policy. We've got a lot of debate. This is, a, this is a democracy after all. It's messy. But there's no doubt that something important is happening. We're seeing some significant economic progress. Despite a relatively challenging global environment, you know all this. GDP growth, GDP per capita growth, uh, productivity growth are rising. We're, mo we're starting to move. We're starting to move. We are seeing, not enough yet, but we're seeing more money coming in, foreign investment. Uh, we need a lot more, but, but it's starting to happen. Uh, we're seeing poverty rates go down. There's still many too many people in poverty, but we started to see progress. Okay? Something good is happening. We need, we need to start getting together a sense of possibility here, a sense of optimism. Uh, the policy choices that uh, have been made over the last few years in this, in this new government uh, are starting to deal with some of the real fundamental problems this country has had for a long time. Uh, a macroeconomic set of policies, fiscal and monetary policy, that's actually sustainable and more robust and sounder. We'll, we might talk about that a little bit later. Uh, you know, public programs, delivering public programs better and more efficiently. Uh, we'll t we, uh, we might mention that later. You all know uh, some of the key things, the digitization, the financial inclusion, things like that that are, that are going on. Corruption, the, the, the international data is showing that we're looking better. Starting to make headway against that. That is a, a big, big deal. Uh, different parts of the business environment are starting to get better. Uh, there's evidence of that. Uh, infrastructure making some progress, skills, we have a you know, significant campaign to deal with that. Uh, the uh, business regulations are getting a little less crazy and complicated uh, and uh, 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 allowing more uh, uh, vitality and, 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 and opening up opportunities for, for more and more uh, elements of the business community in this country. So uh, there's something important happening here. There's no doubt about it. The real challenge is, where do we go from here? We've taken some really important steps, but clearly, uh, we got a lot of issues still. This country is far from done. And, and as I said before, it's going to take at least 20 or 30 years. Uh, to truly transform the economy. 
we've still got a lot of weaknesses. We've still got a lot of distortions. We've still got a lot of policies that need to be fixed. Uh, and it's going to take a lot of work. Uh, and, uh, you know, informality is still very high. And informality, you know, is, is understandable. Uh, we have to reduce the cost of formality. We got to make it enticing and attractive for businesses to want to be formal, you know, and, and, and get the benefits and, 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 and support that comes from being a real company that's registered, you know, that's official. We got to find a way to deal with informality uh, over time. We still have got a tremendous amount of bureaucratic complexity. It's mind boggling. And you all know it better than I do. But it's even mind-boggling to me. I've been here three days. I've, I've seen it with my own eyes. <laughs> Just complicated. Access to capital remains a significant problem. Education needs to be improved. Uh, infrastructure, although there's been some progress, is still a huge problem. If you, know, if, if you don't have good infrastructure, how can you be productive? If you're sitting in traffic, you're wasting money. You know what? When business, when, 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 when you sit in traffic, you're reducing everybody's wages. <laughs> because it makes you so unproductive that, that you can't afford to pay higher wages. <laughs> we, we, we think of these things as just annoying things. But actually, it, the inability to create a productive business environment is actually reducing what we can get paid, because we can only get paid what we earn in terms of the productive output that we can, we can develop. So stuff like this, we, can t we have a lot of things to do. Um, and what I believe is uh, uh, the government is on a, uh, on a path to deal with these things. And I think a lot of the things we're talking about make a lot of sense. But in order to get it done, in order to get it done, we need, you know, three things. One, we all need to agree on what we're trying to do, on what competitiveness is, what it looks like, what are the key elements, what's the role of government, what's the role of private sector, what's the role of states, what's the role of federal. We have to have a shared understanding. We can't be fighting over what works. We have to agree on what works. We have to have a consensus on what works. The, the best and most successful countries have this common understanding. The citizens and government are sort of uh, on the same page. Number two, we have to have a strategy. One of the things we'll talk about in a minute is competitiveness is affected by almost everything. The roads, the schools, the ports, the, uh, the culture, almost everything affects competitiveness. So we've got literally hundreds of things that have to happen in order to build a competitive economy. And you can't do hundreds of things at once. So if you're really going to make progress on competitiveness, you have to have a strategy. You have to have a strategy that says, OK, Here's where I'm going. Here's what we're going to do now. And then oh, after that, we're going to do the next step, and the next step, and the next step. We have to have a sense of priorities. We have to know what do we need to do now? What is holding us back now? Uh, let's not try to do everything at once. We've got to have a strategy. That, we've learned that over and over in country after country. Uh, and uh, we have to be good at implementation. <laughs> we have to actually get things done. We have to do things efficiently. And that is a revolution in how government runs. Governments are typically not set up and managed around delivering results, getting action, and doing it efficiently, and moving things along, and holding people accountable. That's not the way government works. If we're really going to succeed at this, we have to actually change the way uh, government works. And we also have to change the way the other stakeholders kind of 
uh, interact with government in a way that allows us to be effective. So I am extremely optimistic that we're starting to get on the right path here in this country. You know, the last time I was here, a long time ago, it was kind of a mess. Not the talent, not the skill, not the commitment, but the thinking, the strategy. I think we're starting to be on the right path, but we've got a long way to go. So how do we think about competitiveness then? How do we define our agenda for competitiveness? Well, what we found is that to understand competitiveness, you have to understand a sort of a, a broad, uh, sort of holistic uh, um, uh, framework. Uh, competitiveness in any, uh, in any country or, or, or region or state uh, starts with what we call your endowments. Every country has endowments. Endowments are things like you have land. You have maybe some natural resources to include things like growing conditions where you can grow crops and things like that. Uh, you have a geographical location. You, you, you're somewhere in the world. You have certain neighbors uh, that you trade with. Uh, you, you're, you, you, you have access to the ocean so that you can ship goods you know, more efficiently. Uh, you have a population, a very large population in this, in this case. You have a certain land area. All these things are endowments. You inherit your endowments. You inherit this from history, from long past. And the endowments matter for competitiveness. If you have a very, very favorable endowment, if you're in a good location in the world, if you have good access to the ocean, if you have uh, you know, uh, a lot of natural resources, that helps. <laughs> That helps create prosperity. That's the kind of foundation on which prosperity is built. But what we found is that just relying on natural endowments or inherited endowments doesn't usually get you very far. Uh, it's particularly clear with natural resources. If you have a lot of oil or something like that, it feels good. You know, you got all this oil so you can pump the oil and sell it. But what we find is many, many oil-rich countries don't do very well. Back to my example of Venezuela. They got a lot of oil. Uh, but they're getting poorer and poorer. And the reason is, it's not the endowments you have, it's how you utilize your endowments. Your ability to utilize your location. The ability to take your natural resources and and, and, and productively uh, turn them into uh, other, other uh, uh, strengths that you can, and investment capital that you can uh, use to improve your business environment. So endowments are important. We have to understand what they are. We have to figure out what unique endowments we have in this country to draw on. And we've got to take advantage of those. And that can include things like history and culture. Uh, because that, that can attract people to want to come. We've got to think about those endowments. Every region of India that, when it develops its strategy, has to understand what its particular endowments are uh, and build on them uh, and, 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 and bring out their productivity. But this is not going to get us to prosperity. This is not going to get us to prosperity. Uh, to get to prosperity, we have to add two more layers. One is what we call macroeconomic competitiveness. We have to have a sound and stable set of macroeconomic circumstances that cut across the entire economy. Uh, one is uh, um, monetary and fiscal policy. We have to have a stable monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, 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 we got, we got to, we've got to get our spending aligned with our inflow. If we have budget that's totally out of balance, we're going to create instability, and that's going to reduce investment, and that's going to reduce productivity. We need, we need a stable monetary policy, hopefully keeping inflation low. We have to manage that. 
Uh, we need a sort of a, a way of managing the economy that, that minimizes economic cycles and shocks. Uh, and that has to do with banking uh, regulation and our central bank and, and a whole lot of institutions. So uh, this country is making good progress on the macroeconomic side. This is one of the great things that has been accomplished over the last few years. We got a, we got a ways to go. The public spending at the state level is not quite as balanced with the revenues. We got a lot of state deficits, but at the federal level, we made a lot of progress. We're going to have to extend that progress more broadly. But this is critical to competitiveness. If, if, if you've got a high inflation and economic instability, it kind of stops progress on productivity and the business environment. Um, we, have to, uh, we have to have human development and effective public institutions. We, you know, uh, if, if people aren't educated, we're not going to be productive. If people are sick uh, or can't go to work, we can't be productive. Uh, I mean, it's about equity, but it's also just about reality. We have to see that we've got to make progress on, on, on these issues of human development. And, uh, you know, if, if mo a lot of our people don't have access to work because they're discriminated against, that's not good for productivity. We need our people to have access to whatever they need to equip themselves to be a productive member of the economy. Uh, so human development really matters. We've got to have a society that with rule of law where people have to follow the rules and where if you don't follow the rules, there's consequences because if we have no rules, we can't be productive. <laughs> and we just, we've seen that over and over again in country after country. And we have we need government institutions that are actually effective, that they deliver what they're supposed to deliver. Whether that's uh, good regulation or whether that's uh, various public services. Uh, and uh, I think there's a real effort in, in government here in India today to kind of make government, the machinery of government, actually be, work well and be efficient. And uh, so that's good. We're, so we're making some progress here. On, on the human development uh, front, we, uh, again, what we found is you need, a, you need both economic progress and social progress to progress I, I, together. I, I, I made this point earlier. We'll talk about this this afternoon. Uh, there's, uh, we're starting now to have a very systematic way of measuring the health of a society and the, uh, the, the, the basic human development of citizens. And this, this we'll talk more about this afternoon. Uh, we are uh, starting to measure how well we're doing. There's a very important effort in India now, uh, uh, Amit and, and Michael Green from Social Progress Imperative will we'll talk about this over coming weeks, where we're starting to measure social progress state by state by state with multiple dimensions. And this is not, this is not surveys. This is actual the best, best hard data we can find. And, and what we're seeing is, is good because if we look at how things have, hap have progressed from 2005 to 2016, virtually every state has improved on these measures of well-being and education and food and nutrition and the this, this set of factors that really matter in terms of, uh, of you know, human development and, and, and social development. So uh, again, we're, we're, we're making headway here, but we've got to make sure that we continue to pursue this agenda. Uh, this is a country where we, we, if we're going to ultimately be a successful country, we have to solve the social agenda. We can't just focus on the economic agenda. We have to do both together, and they'll be synergistic. So that's level two. Endowment is level one. That's our base. That's what we inherit. Our macroeconomic circumstance that cuts across the entire economy, that's kind of level two. We've got to raise the bar there. Monetary and fiscal, human development, 
uh, public institutions. Um, but what we found is that true prosperity comes from that third lever, layer what we call microeconomic competitiveness. And microeconomic competitiveness starts with uh, firms. This, this guy just doesn't like me. OK, here we go. It starts with companies. If you don't have productive companies, you can't have a productive economy. Companies have to be managed well. We have to raise the standard of management in our companies. We need companies that are good at operations, that are good at manufacturing, that uh, learn to be efficient in the use of their employees. Uh, uh, so we have to raise the bar in the business community. We've got some world-class companies in India, but we've got many more companies that have a long way to go in uh, being world-class, best practices of management. Uh, and this is critical to the competitiveness agenda. We can't just worry about government policy. We have, to, we have to worry about how our business community is progressing. And we've got to be raising the bar. And, and, and that includes the smaller companies and even the informal companies. Because again, remember, the iron rule, prosperity depends on productivity. You can only pay yourself based on how productive you are because we're in a global economy. Uh, so we've got to worry about our, our companies. We've got to worry about the business environment in which companies operate. We can have great companies, but if they're in a lousy business environment, they're going to be thwarted. They won't be able to be productive. They won't be able to be successful. Uh, and so uh, we have a lot of work to do on raising the business environment. Government is working on this, but it's complicated. Uh, this is the kind of framework uh, now that is pretty well accepted for looking at the business environment. Uh, it's usually called the diamond model uh, because there's, you know, there's four corners and, uh, and, and what we want to do is, is polish this diamond. We want it to get better and better and better. And the more, the better quality of the business environment, the more productive firms are able to be. So the business environment has to do with things like how good are our human resources? Do we have enough skill so that companies can hire people that will actually be efficient and do work? Um, is there enough capital available to invest in stuff? And this is an issue in India. It's just not good yet, good, well-developed access to capital. Uh, fiscal infrastructure. We talked a lot about that. Again, it, you know, if, if the infrastructure is bad, then it's just like having a drag on every single company. Uh, and that includes electricity, as was said earlier by the minister. If you can't get electricity uh, efficiently, uh, it's pretty hard to run a, an efficient company if you have to do everything manually without power. Uh, scientific and technical infrastructure. We've got to be able to infuse our companies with, with better technology, digital is, is key for India. Uh, and there's also what we call the administrative and regulatory infrastructure. How complicated is it for a company to navigate? If it's complicated, then it drags us down in terms of productivity. And, it, and, and the more complicated it is, the lower the wages are going to be because we're not delivering a very good output. So there's, a, there's the inputs, having the right incentives. I mean, we've had too many subsidies, and uh, we, had, we haven't had enough competition within, within India. Uh, you, you, can, you can read some of these areas. Uh, we have to create an environment where companies have to compete. What we know is if you, can't, if you don't have to compete, you're not very productive. And we've got, you know, we have too many companies here that have a legacy of really not having to compete. So therefore, they do well, but they're not productive. Therefore, uh, they're not really lifting uh, uh, the economy. We need, uh, we need local needs uh, that get more and more demanding. We want local consumers to expect quality and demand it. Uh, uh, we want government to actually uh, be a demanding customer. Government buys a lot of things. 
The best governments that do competitiveness well use government purchasing to drive the economy forward. Not by the size of their purchases because they, they want better goods. They, 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 they use government purchasing as a way to raise the standard of industry. And we need supporting industries. You need to be able to find a supplier. If you need a component, you need to have somebody you can buy that from. Having to do everything yourself is not efficient, it's not productive. So we have to keep moving the business environment. We've got to keep moving it forward. Uh, you know, and in any country, I mean, this is Peru. I, I've done a lot of work on a national strategy for Peru, and Peru is moving. And hopefully you guys can move just as fast as, as Peru is moving. It's much easier in Peru. It's not easy, but it's much easier than this country because of the complexity, the diversity, the history. But, you know, Peru has got some real strengths, but they've got a lot of things to fix in their business environment. Their rigidity of employment is too high, not enough competition, not very many suppliers, uh, and so on. You can, you can see that. What we have to do is we have to really honestly assess our business environment in India systematically with real data, and we got to get on a path of raising the bar. And that's the only way we're going to become more productive, and therefore that's the only way we're going to see a you know, sustainable rise in our standard of living. Uh, and I think this government is beginning to do that. There's a long way to go. Uh, you know, part of the business environment is, is sort of all these things that have to do with the cost of doing business. You see, you know, how, how hard is it to get credit? How, do you, how hard is it to deal with bankruptcy? How hard is it to register property? How hard is it to actually trade? How much bureaucracy is there involved in exporting and importing? All these things, uh, if it's hard to do business, then it's, you're not going to be productive. Uh, you know, a lot of people ask, well, why aren't there more foreign investors coming in to India? It's because of this stuff. If it's hard to do business here, then they're going to find some other place and, uh, and they're going to operate there. So we're competing to have an efficient business environment. That's what we have to, that's what we have to understand. And uh, this is the World Bank doing business indicators. One of the things I'm delighted to hear is actually the government is using these indicators, which are very well accepted around the world, and measure it in a pretty good way. They could be better, but in a pretty good way. They're using this scorecard to actually drive both national government policies and state policies. And I've seen this in a number of countries where there's literally a whole team in the government that looks at these things and says, how can we make our ranking better? What do we have to do? What do we have to fix? What laws do we have to change? How can we get that permit in one day rather than have to take six months to get that permit? You know, all this process of just raising the bar and stripping out a lot of wasted effort and wasted time and bureaucracy and craziness, this is how you build prosperity. Uh, we're seeing that happen in this government. It's very impressive to see that effort at the nitty gritty not just grand policy pronouncements, but nitty-gritty, raising the bar. Um, and a, a final thing in the microeconomic environment is really important for India, and that's the concept of clusters. And uh, a cl what's a cluster? Uh, a cluster looks like this. This is a simple example of a cluster. What we find is that economic development and economic growth are accelerated where you can create a, a critical mass of companies and supporting industries in the same field, usually in the same geographic region. Uh, this is a tourism cluster in Australia. I'm just showing that because we all understand tourism uh, and what it's like. And you can see tourism is more than just where are you going to visit. Tourism has to do with a hotel, it has to do with the meals, it has to do with the transportation, the taxis, the cruise ships, the restaurants, the travel agents. 
But a cluster also has to do with the suppliers, the food companies, the property services companies. It has to do with you know, things like souvenirs and being able to change your money. What you see is if you want to be really, really special and, and excellent in tourism, you can't just have one hotel uh, and one, one place to go and look. You, know, you need the whole cluster. It, and if you have a strong cluster, you're much more productive. These companies are all reinforcing each other. And if we can gather uh, a cluster, we find that we have tremendously better productivity and innovation. Uh, but we also need some public institutions, educational institutions. Who's going to train the people to work in the hotels? We need to make sure that happens. And uh, so that's, that's part of the cluster as well. We have some of these in, uh, in, in India. We, we have the pharmaceutical cluster, well, well established. This is what a competitive economy looks like when we can build these. Uh, and we've got to build hundreds of them all across India. There's, there's quite a few efforts underway here, but, but we have a long way to go. Um, and what we know is if we can build these clusters, this is the ticket to turbocharge and accelerate our competitiveness improvement. It's what we find is this is how you grow jobs rapidly, you create these clusters. Uh, this is how wages go up, how innovation goes up, how new businesses form, they form within these things. Uh, that's the new, best new thinking about how to accelerate economic development is cluster-based policy. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, we, have, we have some clusters. Whoops, this data, there's something wrong with this slide. So good, I'm behind, so I'll just forget it. Uh, uh, you know, in, in any economy, there's a lot of clusters. <laughs> We've done, we've done fundamental work on this, uh, looking at economies from all over the world. And, and the, India has some interesting positions in, in a few of those areas. But it's such a large economy, we, we, we need to broaden the number of areas where we have a critical mass, where we have these clusters. Uh, and we've got to build on the ones we have and make them better and more effective and more efficient. The things in yellow and green are areas where India is relatively strong. This is, using, this is based on our trade position. Uh, the way economies grow is they build from cluster to cluster to cluster to cluster. You know, this is the Singapore story. You all know that story. Singapore now has quite a diverse economy, but it started out with just basically shipping. But they built transportation and air travel on top of that, and then they started in financial services, but then they built business services on top of that and attracted regional company headquarters, and then, then they moved into higher education to really support a, a higher wage workforce. You can see the trajectory. They started in chemicals, but built on that to create a pharma industry. Uh, this is the way economies develop, from cluster to cluster to cluster, and, and clusters that are related. One cluster leads to another one that's related. That's the way economic development really happens. And we have to get that dynamic market working in in India. And clusters are a very powerful tool to bring SMEs together with big companies uh, to drive uh, progress. Uh, uh, now, uh, again, we, we, we are very short of time here. Uh, I, this we have a 50 session course that <laughs> we talk, we, where we really try to learn the details of this. This is a really complicated uh, issue. Uh, there's, there's a whole section in this presentation that talks about you know, national is important, but actually regional is more important. Much of what matters for competitiveness is not national. It's region by region, the circumstances in each particular area. So what we've learned is if you want to do competitiveness, you've got to decentralize. You can't do it centrally. You've got to get each region thinking about its unique situation and raising the bar. Each region, each state has to have its own strategy one state shouldn't try to copy another state. That doesn't work. A state should be looking for, okay, what's unique about us? What's our base of business? How could we build on those? How could we make ourselves more unique? Uh, how could we raise the bar on our business environment? That's the way it works. And you can see a, a whole, there's a whole set of slides here that you know, please look at. There are tremendous differences across states in prosperity because their competitive circumstances differ. 
This is our country. Uh, we have huge differences across states. Uh, this is your country. Uh, whoops, what happened? Is that a message? That's a very pretty slide, by the way. I will be philosophical now. Okay, so we, uh, we had a little bit of a glitch. I'm having trouble. This is not clicking very well. Okay, let me. Say again. On which side? My side. Oh, here. Oh, good. So this is just an example of how the different states in India have different clusters. So this is good. We want to build on this. Uh, at the end of the day, hopefully I've given you a flavor for what we have now learning about how economic development really happens, what really drives productivity growth. Uh, coming out of all of this is this fundamental idea that we need to have a strategy. Uh, we can't just work on every little thing separately. There's just too many things. So we have to have a strategy. We have to kind of understand it for, a, for a state or even for the country as a whole. Where are the priorities right now? What do we need to do first? What do we do next? Let's pick five things now, then we'll do five things in a year and five things in the year after that. Uh, so that we can really put our energy behind it, implement, get things done, move the bar. Uh, the government has made some key decisions like that on areas like digitization and, and others, which I, I, I applaud. Uh, we need a strategy. I think we have the beginnings of a strategy. I think we can raise the bar and have an even clearer strategy. And I think that's true at the state level as well. Um, uh, we, to have a strategy, we have to have a value proposition. What's our place? What's our unique position? Uh, we need to get government aligned with competitiveness. Governments are usually too fragmented. There's too many different ministries. Everybody's kind of doing their own thing. We haven't have an integrated strategy where all the parts of government are working in a coherent way. And, and, and this is something that, uh, again, would be an important issue. Um, we got to get the private sector involved in competitiveness. Uh, the private sector has not been the force for competitiveness improvement in India that it should be. Uh, we have to change the culture and the sense of responsibility of the private sector. The private sector can have a profound impact on the success of competitiveness. If we see the successful countries, the private sector is always involved. And they don't see it as charitable. They see it as actually creating an environment for them to get more competitive at the same time. And that includes uh, dealing with social issues. This concept of shared value. The minister was talking about this. This is something that we now understand that, that business has a very powerful role in dealing with social problems, uh, bringing more people you know, into the workforce, improving skills, improving the business environment. Uh, and, and, and we need business to have this broader view of its role in India than it has historically. Um, that is an opportunity. So kind of just to, to wrap up here, what are, what are some of the themes that I have come to believe? Number one, in this country, given the unique circumstances, we've got to have a broad-based inclusive economic strategy, development strategy. We can't, we can't be narrow. We can't be just focused on you know, GDP and economic policies. We have to have a broad to get the a way, get all people excited and involved, we have to have a sense of inclusion. We have to have a sense that opportunities are getting better for my kids, uh, not just me, but even for my kids. Uh, people have to start set, have a sense of hope that, that, that they can actually progress, that there's an opportunity for them, things are getting better. Uh, otherwise, we'll have populism. Otherwise, we'll not get anywhere. That's number one. Number two, we need to move more to the cluster-based model, see the power of that to accelerate development, to accelerate change. Uh, clusters allow us to get not small businesses and informal businesses together with big businesses. And, and we have a whole uh, tons of learning now on how to do this. 
Uh, we haven't done it in India. India has not been very aggressive in this new way of thinking about development. It needs to change. We've we got to clarify the roles of the national and state government. Uh, there, we, we, we're moving in the right direction. We can do it a lot better. There's still, to me, a little bit of a lack of clarity on who's responsible for what and how do we hold people accountable. We've got to get the private sector to be a true partner in development. Uh, it hasn't been in the past. It's, it's not the private sector companies haven't tried to do good things. So many have, but not enough and not the right things. We need, to, we need to raise the bar. We need more data. Back to the professor uh, at the beginning uh, talking about you know, data. We've got to benchmark ourselves. We've got to be honest, 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 honest. We've got to know the facts. Uh, we've got to start measuring more stuff, social stuff, economic stuff. Uh, there's a lot of efforts, Amit and his team at the Institute are being very, have been a very important role in improving transparency and improving benchmarking and improving the data available uh, to uh, make policy, to make better decisions. And then I think finally we need a shared vision for the country. Right now, uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of optimism in, in some circles. There's a lot of angst and controversy. Uh, we have to find a way to get the citizens of this country to understand what they could become. The best success in economic development is, ha has to inspire people. It has to sort of start to describe a future that is very attractive. A future that people can imagine uh, uh, that will, will motivate them to collaborate and to work with others and to tackle the issues that have to be tackled. Uh, we, we need a, a vision of what India could become, of what role it could have as a society. Of, of how it could lead, of what the country really stands for. That uh, we have a lot of diversity in this country, and tremendous diversity and differences of views and you know, religions and all kinds of diversity uh, of circumstances in this country. We have to find, at least at some level, a way to have a common uh, view of what a good future would look like that's inspirational that will get people to help move the ball forward as opposed to fight for their little point of view or their little uh, issue or their little special concern. Okay? So this is intangible, but I, I, can, I can tell you that uh, in my experience in many parts of the world, this really matters. And so we have to find a way to, in, in a way, create this unifying uh, sense of opportunity and uh, I think you can. Well, look, this is uh, one of the most complicated problems on the face of the earth, how to build prosperity. Hopefully, I've given you uh, uh, some thoughts about how we now understand it, what its dimensions are, what some of the key issues are, what some of the pitfalls in thinking are that confuse people. Uh, uh, hopefully, you've gotten a flavor uh, for the challenge. I've made a few comments about India, but I'm learning. We, we need a very serious and fundamental uh, strategy uh, to make all this happen. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, we, we, we can all now start to see how we play a role. You know, everybody in this room plays a role in the economic development and competitiveness of this country. And, and those are different roles depending on which sector you're in, depending on what kind of company you're in, depending on what role you're playing in, in government or, or whatever. We've got, we've got to start to see how we fit in. We have to start to see how we can create leverage through collaborating and integrating with other actors. Uh, and I think, just in conclusion, I think we have, to, we have to have a shared commitment that we're going to get better. That we're not about obstructing, we're not about slowing down, we're not about complaining, we're about getting better. And, and how do we put that culture in place? I think, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the opportunity, it's, it's, it's t painting a picture of a future 
that citizens of this country can get really, really excited about. Uh, I'm, I'm confident you can do it, but uh, we have a long way to go. So thank you, and uh, let's continue the discussion.